a wimbo way, a wimbo way, a wimbo way, a wimbo way, a wimbo way. On the ocean, the mighty ocean, the destroyer flows tonight. On the ocean, the mighty ocean, the destroyer flows tonight. Yeah, I sorry, I couldn't resist. Right, an equitable London treaty is destroyers, and yeah, it's now reached the point where I am going to, and I admit, race through the first part. I'm going. I have done the first part several times, but as I said in the cruiser, and as I. Why I keep doing the first part, the you know the explanation of the treaty system, and why I'm doing the treaty, is because if I don't do it, someone will complain I haven't done it. And then when I say well I've done it all in these other videos, they go, oh well that means you make me have to watch all the other videos. And I go, why well, a series? And honestly, I get fed up with doing the comments, especially on I people always take those comments to Twitter. Why? I honestly don't need to see them. You're just, in my opinion, grandstanding for your own ego at that point. We'll leave that to one side. So, it's the Washington Treaty Series. Today is the 9th of June. And that means we are looking at destroyers. Now, today, during the 9th of June, what am I doing? Well, I'm on HMCS Sackville. Probably contemplating, and I, I mean this seriously, contemplating... The possibility of whether or not she moves fast enough for me to be able to sail her out, to see her out of the harbour and possibly nick a Halifax class on the way. Just, you know, for my burgeoning little pirate fleet of Canadian ships. It's important for historians to have options. After all, and I say this with all love in my heart for it. You only get really a pension scheme if you're a tenured lecturer. <laughs> anyway, here is HMS Kempenfelt. 1,410 tons are standard of British destroyer. C-Class. One thousand four hundred and ten tons. That's not a lot. <laughs> Come on, that's less than a river class OPV. <laughs> that's tiny. It's still massive compared to where they started out, but it's tiny. When you think about the size of the Bermuths, which they're going to wage war against. It's a good ship, too. It does well. Looks practically Roman with that superstructure. It's like someone's put a Roman fort on top of a ship and gone, yeah. There's your tower. What are we doing? Well, as I said, today, well, actually, no, we're not in Sackville. That was yesterday. That was the 8th. Today, we fly back to Hamilton. And today, we are at... Hmm, the Museum of Atlantic. Cool. And tomorrow we'll be hopefully filming Ojwa. Uh, that could be fun. We'll see. Uh, well, that one's the one I'm most worried about of all of them. That's the one I'm most worried about. So I'm combining treaties because the 1936 treaty should be covered, but honestly makes no freaking sense. No freaking sense at all. And, uh, yeah. It doesn't really count, but it needs to be included because it gives you an idea of the context and units of where at least a large faction of the politicians, the politicians who are probably still most upset over the legacy of World War One in terms of the loss of their friends, their families, the, the sheer numbers, are pushing for this to go. And it's... 
The whole treaty system can be seen as a marriage between two groups. There is the group who are especially strong in the US lobby who want to make Japan as weak as possible. Because they need to crush Japan. And there are the group in both US, UK, France, most of the European powers. Who fundamentally believe, A, that the naval arms race was what caused World War I, which is just not true. It's a symptom of what caused World War I, but it's not what caused World War I. Um, you can actually lay the blame more at Ka the Kaiser's feet than the, than the naval race. And that believe that the way to, that everyone is as horrified by the concept of war as they are, and therefore there is no real likelihood of war. The only prob uh, possibility of war is warmongery, and the best way to deal with warmongery is by not producing weapons, so no one feels they need to have weapons. You see, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's a common phrase we've heard many times over the years. And you can see the logic. You can see the side where it's coming from, these people. It's coming from a hurt. It's coming from a response. And it sounds logical. But it's not the case. Basically, you can achieve peace best through balance. Now, we prefer it not to be the kind of balance you had during the Cold War, where you're always 45 minutes away from blowing the entire planet up. That's a bit of an extreme form of balance, rather more balancing on a knife edge. Um, but if you think about it, when is the other period of relatively relative peace? Probably the latter half of the 19th century. Yes, there are often conflicts, trust me, there is no, it's not panosably always peaceful, but it's relatively stable. In that period, no one is pursuing disarmament. Yes, no one's also pursuing massive rapid rearmament with tons and tons of weapons, oh, apart from perhaps the Germans, but that's mainly in the 1890s onwards, so we'll leave that to one side. What it is, what, what, and you've got the US Civil War, but that's the 1860s, and that's caused by a, partic a particular US problem. Although there is international excitation of it. But broadly speaking, in terms of compared to the standard of human history, that's relatively a peaceful period. This is the thing. Humans do not have such a thing as a peaceful period. There is almost always a war going on somewhere. And if there isn't, there's certainly about half a dozen brewing. But there is a relatively peaceful period. And most of those relatively peaceful periods are built upon strength and mutual strength. Not on mutual weakness. The knowledge that you both can kick the sloop out of each other tends to work in that that encourages you to uh, sit down whereas if you think that what the other side can do to you is not going to be much then why bother about it if you're just going to get a slap on the wrists well, how's that going to stop me doing anything? What are you doing? Killing a gnat for me? And if all I'm capable of doing to you is a slap on the wrists, then I might as well squabble and fight you all the time because it's never going to do any real damage. The trouble is, 
eventually one side gets annoyed with the slapping and goes, that, and that can hurt. And then the other side does that, and then you get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that escalates, and that causes a big war. Whereas if you both come in straight off with this, well, we know that will hurt. So let's talk. It's terrible. <laughs> it usually applies to the realism school of international relations rather than the liberal school of international relations. But I like the hope of the liberal school. I just know that history tends to start at the side with the realist school. And how am I making the changes? Well, I've left the Washington Treaty as left as written, so I have to actually make more changes in a way to make this work. The Washington Treaty was rather easy. It could be the same people, same thing, just change around some of the food, basically. Uh, with the London Treaty and make it work, well, I need to, I can't change the Wall Street crash because that's a massive point of history. Luckily, the Conservative and Labour Party governments, in terms of the actual achievement of their policies, rather than the way they're polishing up their policies, not that massively different. Conservatives are just slightly more pro-defence spending than Labour. Um, Ramsey's a very good Prime Minister, but he is completely horrified by the concept of war. Baldwin is not much better, but he's just a tad bit better. Um, he's far less let's give peace a chance and far more let's give armed peace a chance um it's hoover or smith in the us and frankly i decided in the end hoover was no help to navy uh, to naval spending or defense spending in any way shape or form so um let's go with smith most common class of destroy in the world at this point the american four stacker 1310 stun standard It's a good looking ship. It is. That's packed into 1,310 tons in standard. So, 1930 treaty as it applies to destroyers. Well, again, capital ships are the ones which are agreed not to be replaced. I know in my equitable version I'm going to change that, but that means that there's no, no need for me to change anything policy about not building destroyers. And destroyers are not exceeding 3,000 tons. And if laid down before the 1st of January 1921, they are allowed 12 years of life. Laid down after the 31st of December 1920, they are allowed 16 years of life. That's a bit annoying. That means the new destroyers are allowed 16 years. But in for the Royal Navy, good terms. The V&W destroyers, they could replace them all. But if they did replace them all, then they'd have a load of destroyers. In 16 years' time, they'd be uh, they'd be good, well placed to be replacing even more. But uh, they might be a bit trouble in eight years' time should someone change the treaty scenario because they have a load of destroyers and plus how to build a load of destroyers. It's it's an interesting time. It's the same for the Americans with the um, the four stackers. Now, Article Fifteen: Destroyers, surface vessels of war. The standard displacement which does not exceed one thousand eight hundred fifty tons. The gun not above 5.1 inch in caliber. Okay. Destroyers. USA is allowed 150,000 tons. British come off, 150,000 tons. Japan, 105,500 tons. Okay. Now, in the destroyer category, not more than 16% of the allowed total tonnage shall be employed in vessels of over 1,500 tons. Those are, of course, the destroyer leaders. This is what creates the destroyer leaders. Yes, we're allowed to build destroyers of up to 1,850 tons, but only 16% of your tonnage is allowed to be allocated to them. 16% of your tonnage. Okay. Now, 
This was an interesting thing, because I was thinking, well, usually destroyer leaders are about the ninth member of a flotilla, so what is this? Because 16% of my tonnage, that's not one ninth of my total tonnage. And it's going to need to be more than a ninth of my tonnage, a sixteen a ninth of my total tonnage, because they're slightly heavier. So it's probably going to need to be at least a sort of an eighth of my total tonnage, or maybe a seventh. Well, if I put figure about a seven, that's not bad. It's almost a sixth of my tonnage has to be. It, it can be allocated to these things. A sixth of my tonnage. That's a lot, but it's okay. That works. And a transfer of not exceeding 10% of the t large tonnage, t allowed tonnage, uh, total tonnage of the category at subcategory in which transfer is a cruiser is to be made, championed between cruiser subcategory B and destroyers. So, if we consider for the Royal Navy, which had 192,000 tons of cruisers, well, they could theoretically, well, what a category B, Transfer 19,200 tons to their destroyers, which allowed them to build up to a hundred and well, let's be honest, 170,000 tons pretty much. The truth is, that's all rather complicated, isn't it? That's all going to make it difficult for you to work out the exact calculations of things. Because any time you add in a rule like that, you're adding in scope for someone to start fiddling the figures. Think about it. If I'm lying about the tonnages of the total standard tonnages of my cruisers, and I'm lying about the standard tonnage of my destroyers, and if you catch me and say, well, aren't you building too many of those? Oh, I'm using my 10% allowance. Or some of my 10, a portion of my 10% allowance. It makes it difficult for me to check your numbers. Yes, you're going to, you know, produce an exact report. But the trouble is, you've given me, you've put it, written into it far more fudgeable stuff. The more complicated and more nuanced you make the treaty, the more you open it up to being mucked around with, to be it being looked through and adapted, interpreted, downright cheated. I was tempted when this came up to start playing the game of did O and I get it right, but the answer is no, they didn't. The bookie class, the bookie group. Again, the Japanese produce good destroyers. The Japanese destroyers, though, are overweight. Everything is overweight. Why? Because ultimately, someone had prioritized winning the treaty over winning the peace. Because Why not, when you're absolutely certain no one wants to war fight a war against? Everyone's horrified by the concept of war again. Leaving aside the fact that, for a nation like Japan, their experience of World War, II, World War I had been incredibly different to your experience of World War I. Which means their emotional response to it is different. Again, the Washington Treaty, this entire naval treaty saga, is predicated on the idea of everyone being equally horrified at the idea of fighting a war again. But Japan had a good World War One; They had a good Russo-Japanese war. They felt good about war. They'd been winning wars. And they still had a chip on their shoulder about America. Because of what America had done to them. I know it's something which people like to forget, but yeah, the Americans forced Japan to open up.
It's one of those interesting things when someone says, talks about to me about the right to privacy. I sit there and go, well, that's a interesting idea to have, and I, I think people do have it, but in people have it, the countries have a right to privacy. In which case, there's a long history of other countries turning up and going, I want to trade with you. No. Boom. You will trade with me. You will open up your ports to my traders. Because if you don't, I will blow them up. It's kind of invasion of right to privacy. Honestly, the 1936 treaty has pretty much nothing in it which would you consider applicable to destroyers. Absolutely nothing in it. There's nothing there. They are, in generic terms, you could say mentioned, mentioned as vessels which do not carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6.1 inches and a displacement of which does not exceed 3,000 tonnes. So I suppose if you really wanted to read that, you could say, well, I, now I can build a 3,000 ton destroyer. <laughs> but it didn't come to pass. USS Dale, 1,365 tons standard. The US Navy's attempt to build... Well, let's be honest, that looked like one of the most underarmed U.S. Navy destroyers you've ever seen in your life. Before someone says, well, it's got five main guns and it's got torpedoes. Yes, I know it has, but for a U.S. Navy destroyer in the 1930s and 40s, that thing looks naked. I know it's pre-World War II, and I know it rapidly expands its weaponry. But still, <laughs> that thing is barely anything on it. It's a nice ship, though. I like the lines. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, for starters, we could adjust the equitable ratio as put forward in the Washington Treaty. And if you're building a bit more, this could help the UK and US economically. Reinforce Treaty Party in Japan, as I've said before, and all sorts of things. So, this is, broadly speaking, what we're going to do. Again, the other ships. There was quite literally nothing in the Washington Treaty other than any ship which is not a capital ship or a carrier has to be below 10,000 tons and carry guns small and 8 inches. 8 inches or smaller. Mm, and you can build as many as you like. See, there is part of me which wonders if an alternate area of history and another what-if scenario, if the Royal Navy then, I don't know, spent the next nine years from the Washington Treaty churning out, I don't know, a, a, a squadron of cruisers a year, eight eight-inch gun cruisers a year at 10,000 tonnes. And then by 1930, when they're sort of going through... We wish to implement this treaty. You do. You really do. Uh, how many do you have, Royal Navy? Uh, 72. Heavy cruisers. And eight more coming into service now. We'd like to put the treaty limit at um, 150,000 tons. So you'd like us to get rid of all of them? Well, that one ain't going to happen, is it? Some of them? Nah. We got rid of all our C-Class, though. And all our D-Class and E-Class and all our other cruisers. We've literally just standardised on this 8-inch Grand Cruiser. 10,000 tonnes. We have 70. We have more than the 70, though, we need for our operations now. We have 80. It's been interesting to see. Whether the US would have kept building cruisers to try and keep up, uh, to sort of keep up with them, whether the Congress would have funded it, what Japan would have done under that circumstance, probably started crying a lot. Um, there, there is all sorts of options, but it would have been interesting. It would also be interesting to see what happened in any future war.
And that would have, of course, kept quite a large chunk of the armour industry, etc., going under such, such circumstances. And a lot of shipyards. Again, if you're building... Ju well, judging by the time they take to build, let's be honest, you'd have roughly 8 to 16 on the construction at any one point. So, uh, yeah, you'd have a fair number of yards being kept gainfully employed by that. The Sullivans needed to be in here. Well, it does. 2,050 tons. That's a war design. That's a post-treaty, this is what a destroyer looks like design. And this was the equitable treaty scenario. I have to be honest, I'd like to see a 15 to 18,000 ton heavy cruiser with a 9.2 inch gun. But I ain't gonna get that under the under the limits I have set myself of keeping it appropriate to history and as close to history as it could be. Harasami, one thousand seven hundred and twelve tons in standard. I love that class. They do look good looking ships. It would be better if they were a little bit bigger with another turret forward, but we'll leave that to one side. To one side. So the London Treaties boil down to ships laid down prior to January 1920, replace at 12 years. After that, 16 years. Yeah, a 1936 treaty does push them all up to 16 years, but mm, that's really nothing new. Because by that point, they're all considered over age. Most of, well, most of the World War I production ships. Surf vessels of the war, standard space in which it does not ref a surf vessel of war, which the standard was sufficient, which does not exceed 1850 tons. Cool. So there you go. We have the tonnage, we have the rough ratio 37, 37 to 26. Which again, if we divide down to trying to get in the single digits, so I'm going to divide by five because that. It makes it nice and easy. So that's 7.4 to 7.4 to 5.2. Not quite the 5 to 3 scenario they were looking for, is it? Not quite. And the 16% and the impact of that. And the number of ships they can have. You know, you've got for the Royal Navy and, uh, and the US Navy, they can theoretically have 12.97 ships of the destroyer leader level. And Japan can theoretically have 9.12. 84, destroy, uh, 84 destroyers for the US and UK. 58.88 for Japan. Not really good, is it? Ah, oh, now this is the beauty. And see, roughly 2,000 tons in standard. There's something interesting going on in the world. What is it? Uh, yes, the equipment and everything has expanded. What was a first-ranked destroyer for World War One? Now the first-ranked destroyers of World War Two need a lot more equipment, a lot more, a lot better sea keeping, and need to have far, far, uh, far, far more capabilities in order to be a first-ranked destroyer. They need anti-submarine warfare, which means they need as thick. They need depth charges. They need surface capabilities. They need anti-aircraft capabilities. They need radar. They need anti-surface capabilities. They need everything. And that you can't get on cheap in displacement types. She is gorgeous, isn't she? So, what's an equitable London treaty? Well, I know I keep referring to the same treaty ratio, but it works. So I'm going to go with it. The 10 10 7 4 4 ratio.
Individual destroyers. I've decided to limit to 1,600 tons and 5.1 inch guns or below. Destroyer leaders. I've kept at 16% of total tonnage allocated units. Um, and they're limited to 2,000 tons. Why? Because I do not like 1,850 tons. It's like I don't like 1,500 tons. I don't like 1,500 tons because if you again look at the, some of the ships, they're all just slightly over 1,500 tons if they're designed for it. And honestly, 1,600 tons gives you a little bit of an edge. And you can decide to build some more if you want. I've done figures working out for 1,500 ton destroyers and 1,600 ton destroyers here. Um, you you know, you could also work it out for 1,400 ton destroyers. Especially as for every 7,000 tons, that gives you five destroyers. So, you know, you can work it out the bit of the sort of the similarity. So, using the agreed maximums causes problems with the 15,000 and under 5,000 tons because, well, 15,000 tons is an interesting unit to try and build in. And if you go for the 7, you end up with 105,000 tons, which is less than what the Japanese had. And if you limit it to 1,500 tons, you have problems. If you limit it to 1,600 tons, it becomes slightly more viable and difficult, but it's kind of interesting. Now... I decided to go with 200,000 tons. And I decided it was based on the idea that it would actually be quite fair across it. Because you could basically go, you're allowed 200,000 tons of heavy cruisers, you're allowed 200,000 tons of light cruisers, you're allowed 200,000 tons of destroyers. Yeah, all the same. And it fits. It becomes a nice sort of standardized, everyone knows they're allowed, everyone knows the major power is allowed 200,000 tons. And then that's twenty. That's ten lots of twenty thousand tons for the Brits, seven lots of twenty thousand tons for the Japanese, which gives a sixty thousand tonnage superiority for the UK, US, and UK, which is what the US and UK think they need. And France and Italy be allowed eighty thousand tons. So for the RN, well. US and UK could both get 16 destroyer leaders because they'd have 32,000 tons for that 2,000 ton ship. Which we can imagine what Hyder would have looked like with an extra 10 tons for her standard displacement. And they get a choice of either 105 1600 ton ships or 112 1500 ton ships. Uh, this would give them a force of either 13 or 14 flotillas of new ships, each made up of eight destroyers and one destroyer leader. Uh, one leader. In the first scenario, you'd have a destroyer and three leaders remaining. In the second scenario, you'd have two leaders remaining. Each have advantages. With Japan, it would be 11 destroyer leaders and either 74 1600 ton ships or 79 1500 ton ships. I'm fairly sure they managed to make it 80 somehow, but you know. That would give them 10 flotillas. Right. So, yeah. The cruisers turned up here. Why didn't I put in the destroyers? And I was going to actually talk through with that. Well, the destroyers didn't go in because what destroyers get built could be quite different and quite interesting. If you can build 2,000 ton destroyer leaders, the RN's going to have to think about it. So is the US Navy. They're going to have to think about what they're going to do. Your options are 1,400 ton ships. Like Kempenfelt. Now for 1400 ton ships, as I said, 
Yeah, 7,000 tons. Now, if you take the 32,000 tons off 200,000, you get 168,000 tons. Now, what does 168,000 tons divided by 7,000 ton equal? Well, you'll be glad to know it equals 24. 24 times 5 is, of course, 120. So you could get 120 1,400 ton destroyers. If we go back to this figure again, and you work it through, you could have 120 1,400 ton ships, 112 1,500 ton ships, ton ships, or 105 1,600 ton ships. So, hundred ton. So, two hundred tons separates those numbers, but there's also fifteen ships different. And you're suddenly thinking, well, hang on. Fifteen ships. That's that's real money. That is real money. There's no joking around on this one. That is real money. That's 15 flotillas. So yeah, that is an option for the Royal Navy and the US Navy. 15 flotillas of 1,400 ton ships. Or 14 flotillas of 1,500 ton ships, which is what the US Navy was going with. Or they could go with 1,600 ton ships and get 13 flotillas. For Japan, it's between 9 and 10 flotillas. There are options. And that's the point it brings. Now... When I put in the cruiser tonnages, and I'm going to leave these up as illustrating because the destroyer tonnages are a lot more difficult to foresee under circumstances because the cruisers, the overwhelming desire for the Royal Navy is to get 70 ships. Destroyers, it's getting enough flotillas, but it's also getting flotillas of the right capability. What is the problem for the Royal Navy? Why can't they necessarily race to the 1400? Well, if you allowed 1500 1, ton ships, 1400 is fine because you're 100 tons difference, but numbers should tell. But will the numbers tell over the 1600 ton ships? Will those 200 tons make a big difference? Can efficiencies of ship make for a difference? And of course, then you've got the fact of, you've got 16, 2,000 ton ships going around. They're going to be good. They're going to be your big destroyers. And they will have an impact. But where do you build them as well? Do you build them one a year? Or two, or one, uh, if you're sort of, let's say you build a flotilla a year of destroyers, do you build eight and a destroyer leader, an actual destroyer leader, or do you build, try and build a 1500, a 1450 ton vessel, or a 1400 ton vessel as your destroyer leader, and build a 1300 ton destroyer? The combination is going to be up to you, and how you're going to do it is going to be very, very different. 50,000 tons makes a tremendous difference in destroyers. And where did I get it from? Why was I going with the... Well, A, I was standardizing on something which made sense to me in terms of the ratios. But also, I was actually looking at some of the discussions. And some of the discussions to me suggested a very strong possibility that the British and the Japanese... We're both keen on larger destroyer numbers. The Americans were ambivalent about it. The Italians and French downright didn't want it. 
Why? I think because if you're looking at what happens in the Mediterranean and what it is in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, you've got a race for quality. You've got both the French and the Italians pushing their destroyers faster and faster and faster and faster. And with that happening, they don't want it to also be a race for quantity. Because that's a problem for them. So would it have worked? Well, there are some interesting options in the ratios. Some really interesting options in the ratios. And I mentioned Germany in previous videos, and I've mentioned the idea of bringing Germany in, and I've mentioned the idea of bringing the, bringing the Soviet Union in. Um, bringing the Soviet Union in is a great way of actually causing Japan and Germany to both be neutralized. <laughs> you bring in the Soviet Union, you offer them the same level as France and Italy. And suddenly Japan has to deal with the fact that it's got, yes, it's got its 7-10 ratio, which is fine. It can't complain, but there's a 2 up above it, which is probably the Soviet Pacific Squadron. There's a 5 in the Pacific, probably more likely a 6 or a 7 from the Americans. And there's more than likely a 2 of some kind from the British in the Southeast Asia Indian Ocean area and sort of the South China Sea and East China Sea. And suddenly, yes, they've got seven, but they've got possibly ten worth of enemies around them. And that's before you get into other potentials in that scenario. So, yeah. They'd feel strong and secure because they got their 7 to 10 ratio. But they'd also be worried about all the others. And that might well mean that they actually end up deciding there's a limit to how many wars we want to be able to fight in at once. There's always a possibility of sense breaking out. Now, there is, though, in Destroyers, another rather interesting option. And I did consider this as the foundation of my ratios. And I'd like you to consider it. Making the ratio actually the flotilla. Okay? So, if we do that... Now, if we do that on the tonnages I've given in my equitable treaty, we get each flotilla is roughly 14,800 tonnes. And therefore, we could go through this as limitations. USA, UK, you're allowed 20 flotillas. Japan, you're allowed 14. France and Italy, you're allowed 8. Which I'm fairly sure is more than what was, just, uh, what was, what was listed down there. I'm just sort of going through the maths in my head, and I don't think. Eight times uh, 14,800? Yeah, 118,400 tons. That makes more sense. I've done, it's, I've done four times. I forgot that it's doubled because of the number of uh, ca capital ships, etc. But leaving that to one side, I'm not sure why I did for that one. <laughs> but under the contingencies of these two and Russia at four, Germany being at two, Russia at four, um, so Germany getting half of what France and Italy get. Germany would have 59,200 tonnes, and Russia would, of course, get itself 118,400 tonnes. Now, why does that make sense? Because that's also another way of making it equitable. Working out by each one nation having complete flotillas. Now, if you go back to the original writing, where they're allowed... 
1,500 tons per ship and 1,850 tons for the leader, well, a flotilla would be 13,850 tons. Which is not that dissimilar to the 14,800 tons that, of, that I am giving them. In fact, if we consider it, I'm actually 950 tons more generous. That's a massive amount, but I think it works out better that way and does fit with some of the discussions they were having. I think you can squeeze more out of a 1,600-ton hull than you can out of a 1,300-ton hull. The standard. Now, if you work it out with the 13,850 tons, well, for example, and let's say you give them 15, because that's the number of capital ships, you're doing working on a 5 to 3 ratio, the British would have had a total tonnage different of 207,750 tons allocated to them. Same with the US. So that would give them a flotilla per capital ship. Hundred and fifty thousand tons? Your fifty seven thousand seven hundred fifty tons under what you need for a flotilla of ships under your own and under the treaty's own metrics to have a flotilla of destroyers per capital ship. This is not including flotillas for aircraft carriers. This is not for including flotillas for any other duties than escorting capital ships. And yes, we might go, oh, well, actually, what we do is we use a flotilla to escort a pair of capital ships. Why is the London Treaty not equitable when it comes down to destroyers? Why does it require almost this much change? Because in the end, it is being designed by people who do not think they're going to fight a war. You know how I know it's designed by people who do not think they're going to design a, the fight a war? Because the only times you don't escort a capital ship or a carrier, or anything of that high-value nature, without a full flotilla of destroyers, is in peace when you don't expect anyone to attack you. When you're talking about nations which have flotillas of destroyers deployed around the world as part of their offensive forces, when you're talking about nations which are depending upon capital ships and carriers as their representative power and their ability to deter conflict, and you have a treaty, which, as it's as it's written, not as I'm trying to explain, makes it impossible to defend those ships in adequate with adequate resources. CV passum parabellum, and I'm fairly sure at some point someone's going to start a bingo card system of in this series of of videos. How often I say that. Those who seek peace should first prepare for war. This is what this treaty is not about. See, is supposed to be about seeking peace, but precludes preparation for war, and more importantly, makes you actually look weak. If you can't escort your destroyer, your capital ships, if you can't escort your carriers, you have problems. You have real problems. Now, if you're sensible, what counterpoint you'll make to me is, but Dr. Clark, Alex, what about sloops? You can build as many of those as you like. So surely it doesn't matter how many destroyers you have. The destroyers are offensive tools. We're getting into that. But of course, there is one little issue with sloops. They're fine for anti-submarine warfare work. They're fine for convoy protection. 
are not supposed to be designed for a speed greater than 20 knots. This precludes them from keeping up with capital ships in a full battle fleet operations. It's hard enough for destroyers to keep up with them, especially the big destroyers. It is hard enough for them to keep up with them in all weathers. But for a sloop, it's almost downright impossible. Because it's not what they're designed for. They're long-ranged, ocean-steaming, light-present ships. Forward-deployed. Minesweeping. Anti-submarine warfare. Things which require endurance, maneuverability, and the right level of firepower. So, that's the other option. Do it as each unit represents a flotilla. I'd say you need at least 20 flotillas for the Royal Navy. At least 20. Whether you do my version of capital ships procurement or not, I'd say you need at least 20 flotillas. And that's not of including overage ships. Remember, this is all. This doesn't apply to overage ships. You can keep them. You can do all sorts of things with them, and the Royal Navy does. And the trouble is with overage ships. What can they be really used for? Well, the Royal Navy converts them into long-range convoy escorts and convoy escorts for uh, the coastal convoys and all those duties. And they do really well in that. They are really good for that. The V and W destroyers from World War One. They're good for those jobs. But as much as you can lose wars if you fail to escort convoys properly, escorting the convoys alone doesn't win the war. That's taking the fight to the enemy. That's establishing control of the sea. That's being able to maneuver your forces into areas which threaten your enemy's communications and ability to use the sea. For that, you need the modern destroyers. And in numbers. Fine. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found Destroyers interesting. Um, you'll find more about this sort of thing actually in my book. <laughs> I'm going to keep plugging up. I like it. I know it's not what people expect. Um, there is part of me which thinks that the title should be reversed, that it should be the Genesis of the Modern Destroyer is at the top and the Troubles, Battles, and Daring's are below. Especially that usually comes out because, of course, going to Canada, people go, well, you've got lots of the, about the Canadian destroyers in there, and you've got lots about the Australian destroyers in there, and I go, no. And it's a simple reason. COVID hit. I couldn't go to the archives in Canada. I couldn't go to the archives in Australia. And I didn't think it would be honest to write a book which was entirely dependent upon the work of Oz. Bits of it I couldn't change and had to depend on the scholarship of others. And I've acknowledged them and thanked them. There's some very interesting end notes written in there. But mostly, thankfully, I didn't have to. Because I changed it. I, I got rid of the Canadian and the Australian sections which I'd planned. But hopefully in time. I'll be able to write another book, an expanded book, and I'll do more about tribals, battles, and daring's. And I will get to include the Australians and the Canadians and why they went for the tribal class destroyers and why they went for the battle class destroyers and why they went for the daring class destroyers. Because there are good reasons for it. And it does go back to them being able to step up into uh, to punch above their weight in terms of role, especially in peacetime role. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed, and um, hope you have a nice time.